friend of mine sent me a book. A lot of people know that I like to read, you know, since I was a kid. People like talking and naturally we all know how to conduct a conversation. But I always thought if somebody went to the trouble of writing something down, maybe that's a, worth a little more than a conversation. So people send me books and one, one wonderful book that I, that I want to share with you is African Game Trails by President Theodore Roosevelt. And um, I'm sure there are other editions of this book. It's funny, I read countless books, but I never came across this one. Anyway, some of you write me and ask about books. So I thought at the outset I would mention this one. It's a very, very good book and quite interesting. And this was a um, sometimes quite controversial, and not that it's in this book, but I read about uh, Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, sometimes controversial and largely misunderstood. And I'm not saying that for any other purpose than describing his presidency. It's, it, it's worth reading this book. It, it's about African hunting, not about politics. Um, but I thought I'd share that with you. And for those of you that asked me to make a list of books that I've read, I'll make the list. I just didn't get to it yet. And actually, the video today has nothing to do with Theodore Roosevelt or that book. But if I don't put it in, I'll forget to do that. And so um, here, here we, we go with the main uh, purpose and subject of the video, which is semi-automatic rifles. And I guess uh, governments around the world these days are kind of fussy about semi-automatic rifles, which I guess in some ways is understandable. I mean, all they do is reload themselves. And when I was a lot younger, um, I took such a great interest in semi-automatic rifles. Actually, I didn't even know what a semi-automatic rifle was, but I registered that when I fired a 22 or any kind of rifle, um, especially if I was in a prone position, the, the grass moved, that's a classic expression that I learned later um, was not the only thing that John Browning noticed. Lots of people noticed grass moving because of the amount of gas coming out of the muzzle. Anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I tend to do that. But I thought um, um, I should show you a few semi-automatic rifles and the purpose of the video is actually to describe uh, what I view as the most extraordinary semi-automatic rifle that I've owned. And we'll go back a couple of decades. In my collecting career, I've come across amazing firearms, as you would too, if you spent the amount of time looking into firearms as I have. And I found a rifle, I'll describe to you in another video, video the amazing circumstances, but it was a Sempert and Krieghoff or Krieghoff um, semi-automatic rifle caliber was uh, 8 by 57 very unique action it was gas fed and it was the basis for I think the FG 42 but don't quote me um, beautifully made it had elk um, engravings and other engravings on it and at that stage in my collecting so-called career I um, I didn't actually understand what I had which was probably one of the most scarce semi-automatic rifles of all time. If I remember correctly, it fed from the left side and um, worked beautifully, was beautiful, and then things being as they were, I sold that Sempert and Krieghof, and I invite you to punch that in, Sempert and Krieghof, and you'll see it. It's on Google. Actually, I was surprised. I punched it in just before filming. Um, but why am I bringing that up? Because there have been some pretty amazing semi-automatic rifles and that one gas operated a lot of them gas operated a lot of them recoil operated and we'll get into the main body of the video we'll start with the browning auto 5 uh, in, and i have to cover everything because a lot of the people that write me are young people our most valued people they, they haven't seen these guns. They, they won't see these guns. They're not in catalogs. So you'd have to go to a used gun store. So this is the Auto 5. Long recoil. There's no gas involved in the operation of this mechanism. There is no hole in the bottom of the barrel as there would be in some modern semi-automatic shotguns. 
this barrel re is operated by recoil and that's how it works. So the barrel virtually moves backwards and then forwards and this would normally fly forwards and strip another shell just like that into the chamber. Um, this, this long recoil system involves a lot of mass. You can see the mass of the moving parts. So if, if this was not a shotgun, there would be a lot more pressure involved. Shotguns only operate at 11 or 12,000 pounds per square inch or somewhere around there. 410 is a little higher. Anyway, I show that to you as sort of a um, introduction to the concepts of semi-automatic firearms, which really nobody needs to be scared of. They just utilize the energy of what's available in the cartridge when it's fired to operate the mechanism. In this case, no gas is involved. So I'll set that aside. And then, you know from my hunting videos, the Remington 80, this is the Model 8. I also have an 81. And in this case, we're talking about more pressure. So you can't have the whole barrel re recoil and you need a stronger spring to control the amount of energy in the cartridge. So you can see it's very hard for me to do that with one thumb, but this whole barrel moves backwards. And the reason that this barrel shroud looks so big and the barrel so odd is there's a spring in here. So the barrel recoils inside the action, moves the bolt, and this bolt flies back, compresses the spring, and then flies forward. So you can probably, I think, put together that it's a variation of the Auto 5, but the pressures in this rifle, which is in 35 Remington, are a lot higher. But getting back to my uh, childhood observations, of the amount of gas that's produced by firearms. This was observed by anybody who fires a gun. And uh, much greater minds, a long time ago, decided they have to harness that gas and use the gas through pistons and different mechanisms. This is the Garand that you all are familiar with. So the gas in this case is bled near the muzzle and if you want to read about this I've got another book for you you probably can't make it out but I'll, I'll, I'll write it out for you it's Hatcher's notebook and he describes in meticulous detail how the Garand and the M1 carbine and many other semi-automatic rifles were developed the concept with the Garand was that you should bleed the gas further down the barrel when the pressures have dropped and I guess theoretically I understand that um, it makes sense and obviously this is a very successful battle rifle. I think Patton said it was the greatest battle rifle or implement of all time. Don't know if that's true, maybe at the time. Anyway, uh, if you bleed gas near the muzzle, that means you have to have some kind of linkage to the actual action, which is way back here. And this is really just a turn bolt system. Um, much like a bolt action rifle, you can see the locking lugs there, or maybe you can't. Anyway, there are all, there's all kinds of um, momentum to the parts that cause this action to open. So it's not ideal, and Eugene Stoner later figured out through the Armalite company how to get rid of all of this momentum of parts, and the rifle tends to be very heavy. Um, although it's, uh, you know, it's a much loved firearm. So that's a gas operated one and I'm covering a lot of ground and painting as they say with a broad brush. Um, the M1 carbine leads the gas a lot further back and um, again it's a, it's a turn bolt a lot like the like a mini Garand really and so is the Ruger Mini 14. This is one of my favorite semi-automatics just because it's so light and handy. And the 30 carbine, by the way, can do a lot more than people say, but that's another subject. So then how do we arrive at the most, I think, extraordinary sporting rifle, even more extraordinary than my Sempert and Krieghof? And this, this, it's not that old. This is actually from the 70s. Maybe they made them into the 80s, I'm not sure. It's a Heckler and Koch, some people say. It's other people, Heckler and Koch. 770. 
And any of you uh, that know the MG42 machine gun uh, will know that that machine gun was roller locked. So you can see that the forend here is uh, very slight because unlike a Remington 742 or a Garand or an M14 or a Winchester Model 100, there's no need for a massive forend here because no gas is coming off the barrel. There's no hole in the bottom of the barrel of the 770. Same goes for the MG42. So then how does this action work? And um, I, I've had lots of conversations about this. So we'll take this uh, shroud off, which I've loosened. This is actually a return spring for the bolt. And um, I don't necessarily recommend that everybody take this action apart. But um, this motion here, this is the bolt handle. What I'm doing when I, that motion is not as easy as it looks. I'm actually retracting roller locks. Uh, people will say, what's a roller lock? And it's a very interesting concept. The roller lock, as I said before, does not involve gas. And it is not a long recoil system like that shotgun I just showed you, the Auto 5. It's also not a short recoil system, which you can look up because I didn't show you that today. It involves no gas. It, it involves this concept and I actually went to the trouble of, I mean, it's no big trouble, but uh, this is the best I could do. This is supposed to be uh, the concept of a roller lock. And it's this principle. If I apply pressure to this shape, the circle, on top, I can apply almost unlimited pressure. And I'm actually pushing down. You can see it's shaking. Unlimited pressure. And even this weak cardboard tube will take a lot of pressure. But that's only if it's top dead center. If I move even slightly off center, the whole system collapses. And if you can transpose this concept into a rifle action, that's how a roller locked action works. There are roller locks in here. When the cartridge is fired, those roller locks are top dead center in this position and it won't come undone. As pressure drops, the rollers can move and the bolt can move backwards. It's probably not the most ideal physics lesson, but um, the action opens and then slams forward. Now, I've taken out the return spring. I can put it back together um, for you for the next video. Uh, I've owned this, this, this model, this is the 770. Uh, there's another model, the 630, which is in 223. And there's another model, the 940, which is in 30 out 6. I find the 308 the best one. What's unique about the action is, in my experience, it almost never jams. And the technically minded people out there will probably send me messages saying I'm wrong that the action is actually never locked. And I suppose they're in a way correct. The roller lock is more of a delay of a blowback system. You can have blowback, meaning that opposite reaction thing where the bullet is going down the bore and the bolt would fly backwards like a 22. That works because the pressures in a 22 are so low. In a 308, you'd have to have an enormous counterweight, um, something like the Winchester 401 or the 351 self-loadings. Those, 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 those were blowbacks. Anyway, it's not practical in a 308. So they came up with this concept of these roller locks. And of course, the MG42, I think, is famous for rate of fire. I mean, they fired so quickly. Um, and you've seen these guns in operation in the movies, uh, Saving Private Ryan. There, there have been lots of them. They shoot so quickly that they have to, they had to figure out a way to change the barrels because the, the barrels were were overheating, they were melting. <laughs> anyway, I've never fired my 770 that fast. But these things cycle quickly. It's a very violent operation because the pressures have not dropped. It's there is no mechanical involvement, there's no gas, there's no piston. It's strictly that shell casing coming back after the rollers 
are off top dead center and it slams forward with force and um, sometimes if you use a system like that the shell casing theoretically can become stuck in that millisecond that the pressures are high the bolt can't pull the casing out so they thought of that and they use a fluted cylinder and you'll notice that the case the brass case looks a little different there are lines on it because they allow gas to to feed backwards through flutes in the chamber itself so that the brass does not get stuck if it got stuck the bolt will rip the head of the case off and actually i had one of these years ago rebarreled and the gunsmith didn't know that it was supposed to have a fluted chamber so when i fired it uh, it, I mean it worked but half the case was stuck in the chamber and the bolt ripped the rest the, the, the case not in half it just ripped the head of the case off I'm sure you can understand what I mean also um, to complete kind of the tour de force that this rifle is the there is if you look down the bore some people say well there's nice rifle Mike but there's no rifling <laughs> because it's polygonal rifling um, which you can look up on Google and I invite you to do that. The lands and grooves thing are avoided. Um, I was told by one of the engineers apparently that this was um, out of an awareness for the rate of fire, but I don't know. I don't think hunting rifles are fired that quickly. In any event, very easy to clean. When you look down the bore, there appears to be nowhere, no matter how many rounds you fire, because the... Um, rotation of the bullet is accomplished through a polygonal shape of the bore itself. Anyhow, um, I think given my experience there are unique individual pieces, it's true, and I could talk about some of those, but as a sporting rifle I don't think anything has come close to the H&K 770. It's a pity they stopped making them. The 630 is um, friendlier to shoot in 223 they're they're very well made it's not conventional gun making by any means but uh, remarkable that they actually put them into production and that roller lock system uh, is really something else and this is a very early model if you if you decide to buy one you can tell the early models because the uh, bolt handle doesn't have a polymer shroud normally they do and the bolt shroud just pops off and there are a number of components in here maybe I'll make a video on how to take it down and then oh a removable magazine this just pops out as you would expect from any other rifle they tried to make operation as as uh, familiar as possible as all the manufacturers do but it's still just remarkable to, remarkable to to behold so Hopefully that's interesting to you, and um, these semi-automatic rifles are quite unique. I'm sure I'm forgetting to say a few things, uh, but that's, um, that's all that comes to mind for now. Thank you very much for watching, and please subscribe, and um, I hope you can support my efforts um, by joining Patreon, and um, that's about it for today. So thank you again, and we'll see you next time.